Queer Relation Tips, an IM Clinic podcast devoted to helping you, the LGBTQ plus community, create the love lives and relationships you crave. Welcome to Queer Relation Tips. You know, my new COVID addiction is TikTok, I will admit. I was scrolling along one day and I found Dr. Carlton talking about that stuff. He's a gay doctor who puts up this amazing content in terms of being comfortable and confident with our own bodies. He is amazing and a delight to have on the show. He talks not only about muscular contraction, but the ways that we can live confidently as sexual beings in our own body. I hope you enjoy. So I found you on TikTok, which was really fun. Um, I kind of liked your butt stuff videos. It was very informative and helpful. <laughs> One thing that I found fascinating, just for me personally, mm-hmm. was um, just that the prostate is such a pleasurable center in the body. Definitely. And if we could talk to not just the gay men right now, um, but if we could just talk to men. Absolutely. and deconstruct the stigma you know one of my best friends is a straight cisgender man and i'm always saying dude you gotta try this absolutely Amazing. <laughs> and i actually did a video about that um recently as well uh one of my favorite tiktokers is a straight guy ups truck driver and he he um he said he made a video with basically with him going not sure how i feel about it you know the, the song in the background and his, uh, the, the title of it was when she sticks a finger in your butt while she's blowing you. Mm-hmm. So, um, so I immediately grabbed onto that and said, um, but what a lot of people don't know is where is the prostate? The prostate is a walnut sized gland that's uh, a couple of inches inside the rectum, but it's actually beneath the rectal skin, the rectal valve. So if you, I guess the best way to describe it is if you're, if you're bent over and you're going to the doctor for your, for your prostate exam, you're bent over the table, they, stick, they slide the finger in directly in about two inches and then they press down. That's where the prostate is. So you can kind of, if you explore yourself, it would be, you know, if you're on your back, it would be the opposite. So, and, and, you know, when you're, when you're bent over facing forward, and somebody's behind you it's going to be they're, they're going to they're going to look at six o'clock on the clock and that's where the prostate is a couple of inches in now um it'd be at 12 o'clock if you're on your back and you know mm-hmm. from the <clears throat> so yeah, um, for sure yeah so um so you know tons of uh of nerve endings there and plus you know, the prostate is responsible for making a lot of the juices in in our um ejaculate so um, just simply by touching that area alone, you'll probably start having some emissions and uh, the sensation of uh, the um, stimulation of that area at the same time as the head of the penis is just insane. So if, if someone's never tried that before, and obviously it doesn't make you gay, that's, that's just your body. That's a normal part of your body. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I find it, um, the, the emotion that's coming up in me, if I were going to be honest, mm-hmm. is sadness because Absolutely. it's, you know, there's so much stigma, not only around the queer version of sex, but right. just as men that we have to be only, I'm going to use this word on purpose sure. because I think it has its roots in patriarchy, but men are, can only penetrate to be the one who is penetrated is emasculating. Exactly. You know, it's, very, it's very sad. <clears throat> it's very sad. Even if it's just um, a finger in the anus to hit that G spot, it's still, for whatever reason, part of tax, toxic masculinity it or is. patriarchy. And it's very, very shaming. And the sadness is to say all men, straight men, gay men, whatever it might be, a, trans person to say yo you're missing out on something beautiful a part of your body that should be respected and appreciated i agree i agree it's 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 very um it, it, it's very saddening because you know i think our society especially in, even in gay society um 
a lot of people don't respect bottoms as masculine men. Not that that's important to be masculine or, or feminine or, or, or either, but, but just to automatically assume that if somebody's a bottom that they're not masculine is a huge, huge, huge misstep. I mean, um, it has nothing to do with whether or not you're masculine or not. It's just a pleasure center. And so many people miss that because they are afraid to be labeled or uh, they, they're uh, you know, afraid of what they might like. So yeah, I agree. You know, there's luckily there's so many people exploring these days, and there's so much communication that is being de demystified, and uh, the taboo of it is being taken away, and that's part of what I'm trying to do on TikTok is say, hey, listen, guys, straight guys, it feels awesome. You got to try this. You are you don't know what you're missing. You know, this, mm -hmm. is, this is incredible. Yeah, and <clears throat> to include it not as a novelty, or um, like this uh, weird thing that people are doing now, but almost kind of like this archaeological archaeological discovery to say this has been here the whole time. Absolutely. And how do you integrate it into your sexuality as a part of who you are, rather than as this novelty that you get to play with? Right. Exactly. Yeah, I think that so many yeah. people um, put themselves into a box and uh, and. They don't step outside of that area and they miss so much. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm thinking, mm -hmm. what if, I'm kind of going to pivot here just a little bit, but let's say um, a gay son, let's just pretend you have a gay son and he says, or let's, let me back up. You just have a son. Okay. And he says, dad, what should I know about my body? I'm getting ready to have sex. What do I need to know? From your medical background, how would you answer that question? Well, that's a, that's a big question. Um, uh -huh. you know, I, I, you know, I think being, you know, being as honest as possible is the most important thing um, and from the parent, parental uh, standpoint of things. I, I think describing how sex works uh, from the standpoint of, you know, in the beginning, just the basic biology of, uh, of of, of where things are, you know, what things do, why things work the way they work. You know, I talk, I talk about um, it's, it's nothing to, you know, first of all, put in that there's nothing to be ashamed about with sex and completely take away the taboos about it and talking about it. It's something that should be easily spoken about between a parent and a child. You know, describing the basic anatomy of things, uh, you know, how they work and how, you know, different things may make you sexually aroused more than others. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, I think that um, it was interesting. I did, uh, I was an adjunct professor for a long time teaching graduate students sexuality wow. and counseling. And sure. we would pull in these charts, um, one of the vulva, and one of, you know, the penis and the scrotum. Sure. And it was kind of this diagram and graduate students studying counseling in a diagnosis class for sexual dysfunctions had to label and they could like hardly any of the students knew any parts of the body right exactly and it was fascinating to say like you know as a cisgender man to not know anything about my body or a cisgender female to watch them kind of fumble and say like i have no idea what label goes right. on which little line you know <laughs> and, I, and i think that's really important too because you know not only part of your sexuality but um, especially in a young man, um, you need to know what you're looking for for like testicular cancer. You know what's normal, what's not normal. You know, mm -hmm. you know you have the testicles that are you know nice and smooth, but at the top you have the ep epididymis, which is kind of like a little lumpy, bumpy area. And some people don't know what that is, and it freaks them out. They think they've got testicular cancer because there's a lump there. Uh, you need to you need to know what to examine for. Uh, in, in, in the cases of, um, you know, the testicular nodule that could be important and could save your life. For sure. Yeah. I was taught to, um, in, in like a self-examination is to wait till I'm in the shower, hot water so that the scrotum is kind of more flaccid, stretched out, soft. Um, and then to, to kind of rub and to almost kind of search for a little nodule that felt um, grainy. Would you right. describe it in another way? No, I, th I think that's a perfect example. Yeah, absolutely. 
So uh, you know, the, the majority of the testicle is just like a, a, a smooth um, rubber ball almost. Um, you know, the top you're going to feel some corrugated sort of uh, the tubular structures. That's the normal epididymis. Um, but if you feel anything outside of that or anything that's painful, then that's what you should get checked out for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I was taught once a month. Would you recommend yeah. a different frequency? Absolutely. Once a month is, uh, you know, a, a lot of people, it's difficult to remember that, but if you can, you know, just put it on your calendar, the first of the month or the 30, you know, the last day of the month, I'm going to do it just to keep it consistent so you don't forget. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good little mnemonic there for sure. Yeah. If there was, um, let's say, uh, I don't know, a 23-year-old who's going on his first date, he's mm -hmm. wondering if he's going to have sex or not, he's mm -hmm. going to test out being a bottom. What would you recommend he do to prepare or what would he need to know about his body as he goes into that experience? Well, I think, I think a sex date definitely, uh, especially as a bottom, requires some some planning, you know, a lot of people are lucky enough to not have to plan for that. Um, but the majority of us, it takes a preparation. Um, mm -hmm. and sadly, in, in, in our community, too, it's, it makes it a little bit challenging because, you know, we see on the on the movies, all these romanticized dates where you go out to dinner in a movie and and, you know, coming home after that, the, the gut has a normal motility where things once you once you have food enter your stomach, it creates a signal to your um, colon to empty. So a lot of some some sometimes people can um, build up um, stuff to evacuate down there, you know. So I, I generally recommend trying to if you're going to plan it to plan it around when you haven't eaten for an hour or two, and you have time to clean out, um, you know. Before you even get to that step, a good diet with lots of fiber in it keeps people a little bit more regular so they don't have to um, struggle as much with the clean out process. Uh, there are some fiber supplements out on the market, but you know, I, I think that you know, a, good, a good diet is important. But in cleaning out, I found that honestly warm water is the safest, um, least abrasive thing that you can use. Um, uh, if you buy an enema over the counter at the store, mm -hmm. uh, it may have a harsh stimulant in it that can irritate your rectum and not only make you crampy, but it can inflame things and make you have uh, an increased risk for any sort of infection passing from the top. Um, so um, I recommend if you're going to use something like that, dump out the solution and just uh, keep filling it with warm water, squirting it in. Um, and evacuating it until the water is clear. Now that may take five times, it may take 15 times, it may take 20 times. Um, a lot of people complain that, oh my gosh, you know, I get everything cleaned out and I'm in the middle of things when, it, when, it, when things start and I have a big uh, accident where water just goes everywhere on the, on the bed. I really recommend, you know, maybe walk around a little bit, um, kind of get your body moving a little bit and then sit back down on the toilet to try to evacuate everything that's, that, that might still be in there. And listen, when it comes to clean, when it comes to cleaning out hot water, do not use hot water. It's going to scald and burn the inside. Don't use cold because it's going to hurt like hell and it's going to make you cramp. Now, I, I got a lot of flack on, on on TikTok from some people about, well, oh, well, if you're cleaning out, then you're you know you're you're destroying your gut flora, and that's just bad for you. And I you know I want to tell them, hey, you know the, the colon is five feet long. It's full of bacteria and stool. That keeps, you know, it keeps going through your system on a daily basis, so that that's just going to be replaced every time you, you know, after you clean out. So you don't really need to worry so much about destroying your gut bacteria, from in my opinion. Um, <clears throat> so a nice, nice warm water until you can get cleaned out is really, really um, the best way. Um, if you don't use like a store bought enema, or you, you could have an enema kit from home. Um, a lot of guys that are, you know, experienced in this have a, uh, something called a shower shot, which is something you can buy from an adult store that you can attach onto your toilet or onto your 
shower and and that helps um easily it's got a nozzle on the end of it that's easily slides up in into your rectum you just have to be careful with the water pressure because you don't want too much pressure because it can it can be painful um and uh, don't put too much water in at a time because you don't want to you know over expand things to the point where it it, it, it causes problems um but but definitely cleaning out with, with warm water getting things out of you is important because not only for the for the experience of uh, of the top but also the experience of the bottom if you're if you have stuff in your rectum and you have someone stick their penis in you it might hurt it's not very pleasurable mm -hmm. um but uh you know another thing with 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 the whole clean out process listen that's where things come out that is normal that is nature for, for poop to come out. So if you have an accident or things come out, don't worry about it. You know, I, I, you know luckily in, in my own life, I've had people say, oh, listen, you know, don't worry about it. That's, that's normal, that's natural. Because it, it can be mortifying for people, but it, it shouldn't be mortifying for people because it is a natural thing. You know, just clean up and keep going or just keep going or do whatever you need to do to get to reset. So um, that's, you know, as far as the clean out process, uh, you know, that's, that's the approach I take. Mm -hmm. I think that's wonderful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I definitely have had several clients come in saying, oh my gosh, Isaac, you know, this one horrible moment happened where an accident happened and there was poop on the bed and I'm afraid to ever bottom again. And, it's, yeah. and it can actually be really traumatizing, you know, yeah. but it should, doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be absolutely, absolutely. You know, um, you, you, if you're a top and that happens to to the bottom, you know, be understanding. They, they, you know, they've gone through a lot to prepare for this, and they didn't mean for it to happen. It's just part of nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if absolutely. You're bottom, if you're bottom, don't beat yourself up because, like I said, that's part of life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, I think that there's a couple of different things that I'd like to maybe get your perspective on, but the sure. first one that comes to mind is um, it's a very odd experience, I think, for someone bottoming for the first time or the first several times, because the sensation of the muscles is to evacuate right. matter. And so when the penis is going in and coming out, it mm -hmm. can almost feel kind of threatening uh, yeah. or scary. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. What do you say to help people walk through that sensation? Well, and that's a that's a great that's a great opening to um, uh, some important topics about um, lubrication and preparation for entry. Um, you know, lubrication is key when you're putting anything up there. Um, the anus is a very tight circular muscle, um, and it being a, a circular muscle. Uh, it's, its natural st state is to be really clenched and tight. So to have anything push in there too fast, you, you risk it being torn or hurt. Possibility of tearing the lining, which is incredibly painful. There's lots of sensors there for pain, and lots of nerve endings. So you have to relax that open so that things can go in more easily. So, you know, first of all, lubrication is key. But I think, and, and you know, whether you use water-based or a hybrid lube or silicon-based lube or, um, or, or coconut oil, um, whatever you choose, whatever you find that makes you comfortable, um, <clears throat> the lubrication is really key. But that circular muscle, like I said, at, at resting state, you can make it relax out, you know, to this big, if you need to. Mm -hmm. um, basically, if you think of if you think of the anus, um, to make it relax, one of the videos that I uh, that I that I have on on my TikTok is where um, you slide the, the finger in for just about an inch or two, and you press over to the side, or you can press up or down or over whichever whichever way. That circular muscle will then relax open a little bit. And just keep the pressure there to one side. It keeps relaxing and relaxing and relaxing to the point where things that are bigger than the the opening at resting state can come in. 
-hmm. um, so relaxation of, of things to allow something to go inside is very, very key in my, you know, mm -hmm. from my standpoint. Um, you know, some people don't like fingers in their butt though. They don't, you know, so if you can, you can manage that with progressive uh, size toys uh, from, you know, there's a, there's a lot of stores that have like progression and, and like uh, little butt toys that can mm -hmm. gradually stretch things open a little bit more. Um, <clears throat> so number one is, you know, clean out. Number two, definitely um, lubricate. Number three is deep breaths, relax, exhale, let that muscle re uh, open up. You can use the method I discussed with uh, gently inserting the finger in and pressing over to the side and keeping that pressure there until things relax. Now it may take 30 seconds, it may take a couple minutes, but it will definitely relax. That's a doctor trick that a lot of people don't talk about uh, to, to get people to relax so that we can examine you. Um, so, I mean, you see what comes out of you and how big that is. So definitely there's a, a tendency for that muscle to stretch and allow things to, to exit or enter. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, you mentioned the, the sensation of, how do you manage the sensation of something going in there? Well, I think one of your first times as a bottom, I think if, you, if you're in control, I think that's really important because the position where you sit down on the penis and let it, where you're in control, you can go down onto it and control how fast it goes in, you know, you can control any sort of angle issues. Um, that, that is, I think that's a good way to warm up so that you get mm -hmm. really relaxed and, and you're in control, at least in the beginning, until you're comfortable. Because until the bottom is comfortable, this isn't happening. Um, it's not gonna be a pleasant experience until the bottom is very comfortable with what's happening. So in, uh, in, my, in my experience, um, sitting down on the penis um, to, until things open up and relax, uh, then you can switch positions. And <clears throat> I think positioning is, is different for everybody. Some people don't like certain positions because of the way their body is made. Some people have curves in their anatomy that's natural that they can't do missionary or they can't do doggy style or they can't sit down as comfortably just because of the way their body is made. It's also uh, frequently dependent on your partner because penises are, as my grandma used to say, penises are like sunsets. They're, they're, they're all beautiful. <laughs> they're all, they all have different curves and shapes. Some up, some go down, some bend to the left, some bend to the right, some are straight as an arrow. So, um, I think experimenting with whoever you're with at the time is important to try to figure out what, uh, what is comfortable and what's mm -hmm. pleasurable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. One of my favorite little pieces of advice that someone gave me is um, let the entry happen on the exhale. And for right. whatever reason, you know, that was just, it's so helpful. I, for me, it's, um, it's kind of like when I'm inhaling, it's like tension. But right, right, right. is the release and I like that. Yeah, that, that's a good way because you know that deep breath with an exhale really relaxes things and allows things to go in. But mm -hmm. also very important to manage that speed of entry. Um, you know, some guys just jam it in there and it hurts so bad, especially the first couple of times. If you do it that way, you have to go nice and slow. You have to have lots of lube. You have to have the right angle, and you have to be a a little bit more in control, I think, so that so that you um, uh, that you get relaxed enough to let it happen. Mm -hmm. And then once you get relaxed, you can go to it. I mean, upside down, all around, whatever, whatever floats your boat. But just getting really um, uh, relaxed and comfortable, and um, so that things can happen. Right. You know, and even some, you know, sometimes you can do all this stuff, and it's just not working, or it's painful, or it's just a bad day. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean you can't have sex again some other day. It's just, you know, part of part of life, part of the game. You know, who knows what what could have been going on that day. Um, it's important not to beat yourself up about those things because we all have those experiences. We have all had a sexual experience where things didn't quite go the way we we planned them. You know, and that's just absolutely part, that's part of life. So mm -hmm. you you know sometimes we learn from those experiences about what to do next time. 
And sometimes it's, it's a just iser. You don't really mm -hmm. have to, you can change. It's just something that happens. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> there was, um, you know, I think the, the sensation of going in, absolutely, but the sensation of something coming out, especially during intercourse, mm -hmm. you know, I think I recommend for a lot of my clients to literally get to know their body. What does it feel like to go in? How absolutely. slow does do you need to go? But then also, what does it feel like for something to come out and to trust that that sensation to it's a new sensation because you're used to the thing coming out. It feels like an accident. And right. so when you're in charge of what's coming out to learn that you can trust that sensation as well. I agree. I think that's really uh, key and very important because the more comfortable you are with your own body and your own sensations, the better of an experience it's going to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Hope you're enjoying the show so far. I wanted to take a moment to let you know about a unique opportunity Queer Relationships is offering. Over the past 10 years, I've sat with people and couples and walked them through some pretty difficult times. We all want thriving lives, but creating the love lives and relationships we crave is a journey and Queer Relationships wants to help you on that journey. We're accepting inquiries from those who want to come on the show and sit with a therapist and gain some insight into their struggles. Whether that's helping you find peace with your identity, ways to emotionally handle an unsupportive or critical family, help getting past roadblocks in your sexual relationships, or maybe ways to save your relationship that you fear is headed for disaster, we're here to help. For more information about how to become a guest, visit www.iamclinic.org forward slash queer hyphen relation tips. That's iamclinic.org forward slash queer hyphen relation tips. Thanks for listening. Now let's get back to the show. This might um, be a weird question, but what is it about the prostate? I'm sure there's way more nerve endings there, but is it the pressure? Is it motion? I, I'm sure it doesn't work like the clitoris in a, in a vulva, but yeah, I, what is I, it? What is that? Yeah. I, I, that's a good question. I think that, um, that everybody sort of has a different thing that makes them feel that special feeling, you know, that, that really, boy, you're just hitting it at the right spot at the right time. <clears throat> Sometimes it's the angle that it's hit at. Sometimes it, you know, it's, it, it, some people like it slower, some people like it faster. Um, you know, if it's, if, if it's a penis that's going in, um, <clears throat> you know, um, the uh, angle of penetration, the way it hits, definitely can can be more pleasurable. So, so if you're not feeling that feeling, change up your position so that you can feel it. If you're going in there first with 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 uh, your fingers, make sure that you have your fingers uh, fingernails clipped really short so that you don't do any sort of scratches or damage in there. Uh, and <clears throat> And, um, you know, I, I think that a lot of it is just our own angles. Everybody has a little bit different angle than the person next to them. Mm -hmm. So you just have to find that spot. And also, you know, people ask, well, what do you do? Do you just rub over it like back and forth? Or do you, you know, do you press in on it? I think just a nice steady um, uh, motion over it is, is what, at the right angle is what most people find pleasure in. Some people can bottom and can ejaculate just from being penetrated and having the prostate hit at the right spot. Um, you know, not everybody can, and, not, and honestly, I don't think many people can, but uh, I know that some people can hands-free just come from, from being um, entered and, and hit in the right spot. Um, but for me personally, I think it's that combination of self-stimulation in the front or from the partner um, with that um, anal um, uh, prostate stimulation at the same time too. Mm -hmm. I, I do agree with you. It is a powerful dynamic that I wish wasn't stigmatized because right. it's just how we're made. It's just, it's a beautiful function of the body. Right. And, and I, I think also we, you know, when we talk about that as well, we can't, you know, we can't assume that people are just going to have sex one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, it, 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 people do groups, people do threesomes. Um, and if you're in a situation where you can do that, um, 
you know, either either a, a, an allowing and willing partner, or you're single and you're 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 doing that that sort of thing. Um, you know, it's almost limitless what you can do to stimulate um, in, in a sexual uh, situation. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, someone someone pleasuring you from the back while someone's pleasuring you from the front. I mean, does it get any better than that? That's you know amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I think that the yeah the stigma around this idea that we could be sexual deviants, you know, yeah. almost like slut shaming or whatever oh. it might be. Yes. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think if, if, if anything in this crisis that we're going through right now has taught me um, is that life is short. We all only have a limited amount of time and who knows what's coming along next. Why not make the most of it and get rid of all of your hangups and just experience things, you know, at, at the maximum. Uh, why limit yourself? Uh, life is short, and you know, as a physician, I see it all the time. People who thought that, oh, you know, oh, when I get this age, I'm going to retire and go and do whatever I want to do, and then they get to that age and they have pancreas cancer and it's over. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I think that people need to let go of their hangups and uh, start exploring what makes them feel good because we have a finite amount of time on this earth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I was really surprised and excited when I heard about pegging for the first time, you oh, know, yeah. a girlfriend wearing a strap on sure. and, uh, you know, penetrating her boyfriend. And I think that that's just such a really beautiful way of respecting what the body is capable of and that a man can be pleasured by penetration and that that's not a gay thing. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know we keep coming back to that, but I do. No, I do no, think I, it's so I, cool. I, I, I think that's really cool too. And I think, I think, you know, it goes both ways, not only to have a female partner who is, um, is secure enough and brave enough to want to be able to do that, you know, given all the stigmas that our society has placed on stuff like that and having a male partner who is, um, willing to let go enough of the, of the stigma and the control is, is, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. different times you know i love it yes <laughs> i have a couple more questions the next one that kind of feeds right into this is fetishes um mm -hmm. i've heard as a clinician about a variety of things entering the anus um sure. what might be just some quick you know um words of advice for people who might have a fetish using different objects inserted in, inserted into the anus what would you recommend that they watch out for well, I, I think that's a good, uh, an excellent question. And um, as uh, you know, the most important thing is if you're going to stick anything in, try to make sure it's built for anal play. Um, if you, you know, usually a, a toy that is meant for anal play is going to be flared at one end out uh, so that it doesn't get lost. Um, I posted a video yesterday uh, from a kink master um, uh, on TikTok that basically said you know hey the butt is hungry you stick something up in there it's going to want to suck it all the way up in there you don't want to lose your cucumber or you know carrot or whatever or a candle or whatever else that people put put, put in their bottoms you don't want to lose that kind of stuff in there and it's so easy to lose and then you end up in the hospital in the emergency room having to explain why you have uh you know 10 inch cucumber up the butt um you know not not a fun experience um, and it yeah. often requires surgery to remove. What they do is they put you under general anesthesia and dilate your um, anus open. You know, I remember, remember I told you it was really um, uh, uh, sort of, uh, it has a lot of elasticity. Yeah. <laughs> so things yeah. can go, definitely big things can go in there. But if you let it close and they're in there already, you can't pull it out. Um, mm -hmm. so, so having a flared in. Uh, on one end so that it can't get lost in there is very critical. So, you know, if you're going to use a toy, make sure you use a toy that is, um, that is designed for butt play. Um, crucial. Um, you know, I could show you a box full of x-rays and I think I have some on my TikTok of anything from a light bulb to a Coke bottle to, um, you know, soda can, um, 
just, you know, stuff that you, you don't want to lose up in there. I had yeah, one, I had one, I had one 80 year old straight patient um, who came into the hospital uh, with rectal pain and he wouldn't tell anybody what was going on. He was married um, and um, he was taking his wife's Yakult um, plastic bottles or like tiny little bottles about this big. Um, and, and actually not very big around, almost like a small pickle. And he would play with his, um, play with his ass with those, with those, um, uh, bottles. Well, one day it slipped inside and he went in to grab it. And when he grabbed it, it flanged open like that. And so there's all these sharp spikes of plastic and he couldn't get it out. So we had to basically, again, send him to surgery to be able to dilate his elastic anus so that we could get in there and pull it out safely. But imagine as a straight man who's, who, who loves butt play, but you can't have a dildo laying around because your wife, you know, will, you know, especially at that age, will assume mm -hmm. things that she shouldn't. Um, you know, it's, it, it, it can lead to some pretty bad situations in the medical field. Sure. Yeah, which I think kind of is a, a little hint for the um, the factories and the, the d designers who are making butt toys that they all don't have to be shaped like a penis. Right, exactly. And not all of them are, but you know, like a, a straight cisgender man who wants to experience prostate stimulus doesn't have to, he might have options that feel comfortable for him. He doesn't have to stick a penis shaped dildo up there, you know? Absolutely. I totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, the most critical thing is just having that, that um, flayed, uh, flanged out end so that it doesn't slip all the way in. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Another thing that people talk about with butt stuff, especially is, um, and fetishes is fisting. Mm -hmm. um, so that's when you, you know, use your hand to obviously enter into the rectum and you know you start with a finger and then two and then three and then i you know obviously in porn you see guys up to their their shoulder arm deep and and, and other guys that's a whole other extreme to butt play mm -hmm. yeah and i would imagine slow entry let the absolutely. muscle expand absolutely you're gonna want somebody who's very experienced in that scene you're gonna to want to be very relaxed you're gonna be want to be very clean uh you're gonna to have to be very trusting of someone to do something like that to you because it's it's risky mm -hmm. um sometimes i think when i when i think of that circular muscle that needs to expand it makes complete sense but mm -hmm. as you enter through the body it feels like that has to expand as well is that true can you just describe what's happening there Absolutely, there are muscles in that area that have a that have a tendency to be um, uh, contracted. Uh, the levator ani muscles are down there, and so um, you also have to, as you go in there, you kind of have to let those relax as well, so that um, so that you can enjoy things. So um, it's almost people describe it almost as like a second sphincter. Like you go in, mm -hmm. just that slow, gentle bottom oriented as far as uh, bottom controlled entry, I think is, is key for uh, letting that relax. That makes sense. Yeah. Thanks mm -hmm. for describing that. No one's ever taught me about that before. Sure. Um, what about, I've had a couple of clients come in talking about internal bleeding. Maybe the entry was too fast or um, right. what, what happens if someone does experience internal bleeding? What should they do? What does the prognosis look like? Well, bleeding is very common down there. It's a highly vascularized area. You have the internal and external hemorrhoidal veins, which basically externally and internally circle that anal muscle. Um, <clears throat> so hemorrhoids are where those veins become expanded and engorged with blood. Um, so that's typically one of the most common things that can cause pain and bleeding um, and inflamed hemorrhoids. And usually by um, having plenty of fiber in your diet so that you're not pushing and straining because the Valsalva response of, of having to push really hard to have a bowel movement engorges that area with blood. So those veins have a tendency to expand. 
and that can be very uh, that can lead to some pretty rough hemorrhoids. And you know, a, a, another example is if you're a power lifter and you put a, a, a ton of weight on your shoulders and you squat down and you come back up, that 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 forces tons of blood down into the into those veins, and so those lifters have horrible problems with hemorrhoids a lot of time. So the hemorrhoidal veins are 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 one thing that you you need to be aware of. Um, so lots of fiber so that you're not straining. Um, there are topical creams that can, uh, or an even or even suppositories you can you can get from your doctor to help soothe the inflammation. Uh, those are key. Um, and then some people have hemorrhoids that are so bad they need surgical procedures like banding or actually the surgical hemorrhoidectomy where they actually go in and take out the vein. Um, so um, and then a, a thrombosed hemorrhoid is where there's a blood clot that forms into one of the, the veins down there and it's really purple and painful and you can't sit down and it's horrible. Now, the other thing that we need to talk about with, with um, penetration injuries is a fissure or a tear. An anal fissure is a tear in the lining of that um, circular muscle and it's super painful. Um, it feels like you're pooping razor blades. Um, I mean, we're talking really severe, sharp pain. <laughs> Um, it can sting or burn. It can have you can have bleeding with it. Typically, they heal on their own with fiber, and uh, allow you know. So the the the, key, the whole thing about fiber is making sure that your bowel movements are soft, so that you don't have anything really rock hard scraping out again, so that you don't keep doing more damage. So keeping your bowel movements soft with fiber or stool softeners. Um, there are also some amazing new topical creams that that, uh, uh, that doctors can give to help heal fissures. Um, some of them have some pretty brutal side effects as far as headaches and things like that. There's a nitroglycerin ointment that's amazing for healing a fissure. Uh, a lot of people have come to me on TikTok saying, hey, I have this chronic anal fissure and it's just not going away and what do I do for it? Or this nitroglycerin ointment, basically, if you, if you put it on the, uh, just on the little area that's affected, it causes the blood flow to increase to that area because uh, nitroglycerin is a vasodilator. So by increasing the flow to that fissure, you have a better chance to heal it. Now, even um, there's some calcium channel blocker creams as well, but if you get that on your skin, uh, you have to be very cautious with it. Um, use, a, use a glove to put it on. Um, uh, make sure you only put a small amount on there and only use it until it's, uh, it's healed up. Um, some people have such bad tears though, we're talking really, really bad tears that they had, end up having to have surgery where they go in mm -hmm. and cut the anal sphincter muscle so that it doesn't um, uh, stay so clenched and allows it to mm -hmm. heal. But that's kind of a, that's, that's a rare thing that somebody would have to have surgery for. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. What about um, someone who's bottoming, their partner mm -hmm. ejaculated inside of them? What do you mm -hmm. recommend? Do they just do they clean out? Do they douche again? You know, um, I think that's that's a personal choice um, as far as what to do. Um, uh, there's certainly no harm in keeping it in there, um, you know, if it's a if it's a partner that you that you trust. Um, you know, if if someone is barebacking uh, someone they don't know. Uh, you might want to evacuate just to decrease the risk of, uh, of um, infection, but but honestly, if something's up in there, it's gonna it's already up in there, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think one of the very important things for anyone who's barebacking um, as a bottom, number one, prep. I think that's a very important uh, a very important thing uh, for our younger community as well as our middle aged and older community. Um, PrEP prevents HIV, and it's an amazing drug. It's not without its side effects, and it's sometimes harder to get than than um, than you would expect. But um, a lot of times, it's pretty easy to get. You just have to make sure that you get your bottom tested. Um, if you're having if you're having receptive anal intercourse, make sure that at least every three months that you get a chlamydia and gonorrhea check that you get your RPR for syphilis drawn, that you get your HIV tested. Um, you know, uh, another huge issue in our community that I don't think a lot of guys are really aware of is human papillomavirus. Human papillomavirus is the virus that causes anal warts. 
and it is a risk factor for anal cancer. Now, anal cancer is more common in women than in men, but it happens in men, particularly gay men. And if you have HIV plus HPV, um, the risk is 70 times greater than the general population. So it's now there's a vaccine available for HPV, and you know it is approved for people up to 26, but it technically can be given to anyone up to 70. Um, so I, I'm a huge advocate of the HPV vaccine um, for for people who are uh, barebacking. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, trust yeah. me, I've seen I've seen a lot. I've seen cancer. I've seen I've seen guys who barebacked a lot and didn't, and because they were on prep and they didn't use condoms. And I don't judge that. Hey, that's your personal choice, right? But I've seen people's rectums carpeted with anal warts on the inside mm -hmm. from, from HPV. So mm -hmm. um, you need to have a doctor that knows what to check. I mean, a, a guy should have anal pap smears every year to check for HPV virus and to check for any dysplastic cells. You should have the HPV, HPV vaccine if you are, are okay with getting vaccines and you want to, and you want to do it. I, I, I advocate for it. But you need to have a doctor who knows what they're looking for. Um, mm -hmm. I remember one of my experiences is going to a doctor to get an STI check a long time ago. Um, he gave me a pee, a pee cup. And here, go pee in this and we'll check you for STDs. And I'm like, uh, dude, that's not the only place I have sex. You know, right, right. Me, you know, you got to check the throat. You got to check the rectum. You got to check the urine. Um, mm -hmm it's it's you need to have a provider who understands what you do sexually and you need to be honest with your provider mm -hmm. for sure absolutely i don't we i have a good friend who is a gay nurse practitioner and he recommends the same thing throat urine anus like it's so important you can't just be peeing absolutely. in the cup absolutely yeah. and you know what's what's also great about that especially if you're especially if you're bareback um you can prevent a huge massive outbreak of uh, an STD in your own community if you get checked every three months. Mm -hmm. And some studies have shown that guys who get checked every three months actually have a better outcome than guys that don't get checked as frequently. Mm -hmm. And another thing that I think is important with that as well that we need to, to consider is that um, uh, people can, you mentioned bleeding. Uh, I, had a, I had a patient who came to me from another gastroenterologist um, with rectal bleeding and diarrhea and, and rectal pain, he was automatically assumed to have ulcerative proctitis, which is an inflammatory condition of the rectum. Um, nobody checked him for gonorrhea, you know? Um, he, he went on high dose immunosuppressants like Humira for ulcerative colitis Nobody asked him about his, what he does in his butt. He had chlamydia or gonorrhea, or I forget which one it was. Um, and as soon as we treated him for it, all of his symptoms went away. Oh, so, oh, yeah. Yeah, so huge miss, right? You have, to really, uh, you have to really be able to communicate with your provider. You have to be able to be honest and open. Um, and you have, to know, you have to have a doctor who knows what they're looking for, you know, what to look mm -hmm. for and who takes care of you. If, if yeah. I might, I, I'd like to, to give your uh, audience a website for people to find gay, lesbian, uh, 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 and um, you know, queer um, doctors and those who are, are known to have a good touch with the gay community. Uh, the Gay and Lesbian Medical Association, or glma.org, has an online website directory where you can find a provider in your area that's comfortable with gay people. So if you're not having a good experience and you're in Kentucky and you're in Louisville and you don't know where to get a gay doctor, you can go on there and find one. Um, you know, it's amazing. I have a lot of guys on TikTok ask me, you know, how do I get on prep? Go to preplocator.org and you can find where to get prep uh, mm -hmm. in, your, in, your, in your area. I don't, you know, it doesn't matter where you are. Now, a lot of, you know, some guys are just in these rural, like, mountain towns where there's just no other option other than the, 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 the doctor in the town. That's a little tougher. You know, you might have to do some traveling to, to find a, a, a physician who's a little more gay-friendly mm -hmm. than others. But, but there are, are resources out there for the community. That's awesome. I'm so glad that there are.
Thank you so much. This has been awesome. Thank I you so much. I appreciate stuff. it. This is great. Uh, yeah, for sure. As a psychotherapist who's been focusing on gay sexuality for more than 10 years now, I was amazed to sit with Dr. Carlton and learn some things that I didn't even know about my own body. As an adjunct professor, it was one of my jobs to make sure that counselors could talk about sex without shame or embarrassment or about awkwardness, and we did this by destigmatizing sexual content, talking about penises and anuses and vaginas and vulvas and different parts of the body. Making sexuality and sex and our bodies a comfortable topic is such an important piece in understanding who we are and making peace with the fact that we are sexual beings. I am so appreciative of medical professionals like Dr. Carlton who can teach us a little bit more not only of our bodies but how our bodies experience pleasure, destigmatizing the fact that we have sexual pleasures, that we are sexually gratified. I hope you enjoyed today's episode, and if you have any other further questions, feel free to reach out to us at our clinic. We'd be happy to connect you with a person who can help, even if that's Dr. Carlton himself. I hope you all are having a great day. Talk to you later. Mwah. Queer Relationships is a podcast sponsored by I Am Clinic, a counseling practice devoted to the LGBTQ plus community with in-person and virtual counseling options available. I Am Clinic, create the love lives and relationships you crave. Find us online on Instagram at LGBTQ underscore therapy and Facebook at I Am Clinic. That's I-A-M Clinic. <laughs>